Glory to Jesus Christ, glory forever. My brothers and sisters in Christ, my name is Father Daniel Dozier, and I'm honored to be able to address all of you today on this extremely important topic of Catholicism and Orthodoxy, what still divides us. As Byzantine or Greco-Catholics, the questions of Orthodox Catholic unity are familiar ones to us in the best sense. They pertain to the tragic divisions within a ritual family of churches that still persist after many centuries. For those of us in the East who are in the communion of the Catholic Church, we are keenly aware and greatly pained by these divisions, since we do not look to Rome as our mother church, but rather to the Orthodox churches in various territories with whom we share a familial and fraternal heritage of faith, worship, and life. In many respects, the Orthodox and Catholic faithful of today are all like the suffering siblings of a many centuries long great divorce between the Catholic and Orthodox churches, and we each carry within ourselves the memory and the hope of a restored familial and ecclesial unity that as many have observed clearly needs to be the work of Christ and the Holy Spirit along a path of faith, repentance, and fraternal charity. To borrow an image from St. Irenaeus of Leon, uh, which also was cited by the late great Melkite Archbishop Joseph Raya in his book The Face of God, the Church of the Nations willed by the Heavenly Father is to be a church of churches appearing like a mosaic icon, where each piece having its own unique shape, color, and even at times material, while being beautiful on its own, fulfills its most authentic vocation when it is brought together with the other pieces to reveal the face of Christ to the world. No piece is more important or more beautiful than the other, but all are meant to be one in the Lord. I have often observed that we today have inherited a sad and tragic history of division that we did not ourselves create, which impedes our ability as churches to reflect the face of Christ fully to a divided world. And so what remains before us is the task of working together towards a future that Christ wills, that they may be one, ut unum sint, which was also the title of the bold and beloved encyclical of Pope St. John Paul II, published on May 25, 1995, highlighting the Catholic Church's continuing commitment to Christian unity made and expressed especially by the Second Vatican Council. Towards the beginning of this encyclical, in his section on the need for renewal and conversion, the Holy Father makes the following observation, which I quote here at length. Quote, the Council calls for personal conversion as well as communal conversion. The desire of every Christian community for unity goes hand in hand with its fidelity to the gospel. In the case of individuals who live their Christian vocation, the Council speaks of our interior conversion, of a renewal of mind. Each one, therefore, ought to be more radically converted to the Gospel, and without ever losing sight of God's plan, change his or her way of looking at things. Thanks to ecumenism, our contemplation of the mighty works of God has been enriched by new horizons, for which the triune God calls us to give thanks the knowledge that the Spirit is at work in other Christian communities, the discovery of examples of holiness, the experience of the immense riches present in the communion of saints, and contact with unexpected dimensions of Christian commitment. As a corresponding, in a corresponding way, there is an increased sense of the need for repentance, an awareness of certain exclusions which seriously harm fraternal charity, of certain refusals to forgive, of a certain pride, of an unevangelical insistence on condemning the other side, of a disdain born of a, an unhealthy presumption. Thus, the entire life of Christians is marked by a concern for ecumenism, and they are called to let themselves be shaped, as it were, by that concern. And then he concludes, In the teaching of the Second Vatican Council, there is a clear connection between renewal, conversion, and reform. The Council states that Christ summons the Church, as she goes on her pilgrim way, to that continual reformation of which she always has the need, insofar as she is an institution of human beings here on earth. Therefore, if the influence of events or of the times has led to deficiencies, these should be appropriately rectified at the proper moment. No Christian community can exempt itself from this call. Finally, again, citing the Council Fathers of Vatican II, he continues in the following two sentences. By engaging in frank dialogue, communities help one another to look at themselves together in the light of the apostolic tradition. This leads them to ask themselves whether they truly express 
in an adequate way all that the Holy Spirit has transmitted through the apostles." End quote. This call for engagement in frank dialogue, highlighting the intimate connection between renewal, conversion, reform according to the gospel, and ecumenism, as well as the need for communities to help one another to look at themselves together in the light of the apostolic tradition, is an important one, and in many respects forms the backdrop of my remarks today. The title of my talk is Guardians of the Tradition, the Ecumenical Dimensions of Eucharistic Celebration. Now, I have taken my talk from the motu proprio issued in July of 2021, entitled Traditionis Custodis, uh, Guardians of the Tradition. The subtitle of this letter is On the Use of the Roman Liturgy Prior to the Reform of 1970. In the opening paragraph of the letter, which begins with the name of the letter, Pope Francis says the following, quote, Guardians of the tradition, the bishops in communion with the Bishop of Rome constitute the visible principle and foundation of the unity of their particular churches. Under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, through the proclamation of the gospel, and by means of the celebration of the Eucharist, they govern the particular churches entrusted to them." End quote. Here the Holy Father cites two beautiful passages, again from Vatican II, pertaining to the ministry of the bishops. And I'll just cite one of those here, Lumen Gentium, paragraph 21. Quote, In the bishops, therefore, for whom priests are assistants, our Lord Jesus Christ, the supreme high priest, is present in the midst of those who believe. For sitting at the right hand of God the Father, he is not absent from the gathering of his high priests, but above all through their excellent service, he is preaching the word of God to all nations and constantly administering the sacraments of faith to those who believe by their paternal functioning. He incorporates new members in his body by a heavenly regeneration. And finally, by their wisdom and prudence, he directs and guides the people of the New Testament in their pilgrimage toward eternal happiness. These pastors, chosen to shepherd the Lord's flock of the elect, are servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God, to whom has been assigned the bearing of witness to the gospel of the grace of God and the ministration of the Spirit and of justice in glory." End quote. We note here the concern of both the present Pope of Rome and the Council Fathers of the Second Vatican Council to highlight the critically important role of Catholic bishops, both Eastern and Western, and their assisting priests, and one would not, of course, want to forget deacons, to make present in the assembly of the church the high priestly ministry of Jesus Christ, ascended and reigning at the right hand of God the Father, especially through their preaching, the celebration of the sacred mysteries, and governance. It is in this way, through the apostolic witness as seen in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, after the descent of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, that they faithfully, and in the power of that same Holy Spirit poured out upon the church, make manifest Christ's shepherding and service to the church. On this point, of course, both Orthodox and Catholics would be united in full agreement. The Council Fathers of Vatican II, in the writing of Lumen Gentium, the dogmatic constitution on the church, the light of the nations, have drawn on the collective biblical, patristic, liturgical, and magisterial teachings shared in our common patrimony of East and West. Bishops, assisted by their priests, are the guardians of this apostolic witness of the gospel faith, worship, and faithful shepherding, most especially, as Pope Francis says, in the celebration of the Eucharist. It is for this reason that the present Holy Father says in Article 2 of Traditionis Custodis, quote, it belongs to the diocesan bishop as moderator, promoter, and guardian of the whole liturgical life of the particular church entrusted to him to regulate the liturgical, celebra liturgical celebrations of his diocese." End quote. In other words, it falls to the bishops of each local church to regulate the liturgical celebrations of his local church, inclusive of the celebrations of assisting priests. Now, I should note that the purpose of this particular document, Traditionis Custodis, Guardians of the Tradition, which is rather short and to the point, is to largely reverse the earlier decisions of Pope Francis's predecessor, Pope Benedict XVI, who in 2007 wrote his motu proprio, Samorum Pontificum, Pontificum, encouraging the widespread use of the 1962 Roman Missal in addition to the 1970 Roman Missal, which he labeled respectively the extraordinary and ordinary forms of the Roman Mass. <laughs> and let me only say here that I do not intend in my talk to weigh in on the matter of the Roman Missal. This is far beyond both my area of interest and expertise or even concern. 
Why in the world should a Byzantine Catholic priest have an opinion on such matters as to which Roman Missal is used in the Latin Catholic Church? It's really beyond the scope of my talk. What I find particularly interesting and noteworthy, however, and I believe to be of keen ecumenical interest regarding Traditionis Custodis, is not only the critical focus on the role of the bishops in regulating the liturgical celebrations in their local churches, which again is a point of shared agreement on the role of bishops and their assisting priests, but also the following point the current, the current Holy Father makes in, a, in the accompanying letter which he wrote to his brother bishops introducing the motu proprio, quote, I am saddened by abuses in the celebration of the liturgy on all sides. In common with Benedict XVI, I deplore the fact that, quote, in many places the prescriptions of the new missal are not observed in celebration, but indeed come to be interpreted as an authorization for or even a requirement of creativity which leads to almost unbearable distortions, end quote. Calling to mind Pope St. John Paul II's call to engage in frank dialogue and to help one another to look at themselves together in the light of apostolic tradition, I believe that if we are to consider the theme of this conference, Catholicism and Orthodoxy, what still divides us, that the current state of the celebration of the Eucharistic liturgy in many of the Western or Latin Catholic churches, and the abuses and distortions which are all too often not only tolerated, but encouraged or even taught, is a point of great ecumenical concern, not only for the Orthodox not in communion with Rome, but for those of us of Orthodox patrimony in communion with Rome. And I would contend and hope that this becomes a topic of discussion in a future international or national dialogue between our churches. Now, why do I say this? Why is the manner of the celebration of the Eucharist in a particular ritual church in the communion of the Catholic Church a matter for ecumenical interest? I would argue that it is within the arena of ecumenical concern, especially as it relates to Oh, division and unity, for three primary reasons. First, the Catholic Church claims to be the church that is the light to the nations, the lumen gentium, and this assumes that it reflects as best as it can the integrity of the gospel and the apostolic tradition expressed in its biblical, patristic, liturgical, and magisterial roots in the common life of all the churches which make up our communion. The Catholic Church, as a church of churches, is a mosaic of some 23 Eastern and one Western churches. And the Western Church is not only the largest of the pieces of this mosaic with some 1.4 billion members as compared to the paltry various Eastern churches which make up 18 million members, uh, but it is also led by the Pope of Rome, who is, it is believed, not only has pastoral responsibility for his own self-governing church, the Latin Church, but also in union with all bishops, exercises the fullness of Petrine primacy vis-a-vis -vis all the churches in communion with him. Therefore, it is a matter of significance when the largest of the churches in our communion whose leading hierarch is ostensibly the servant of unity as a matter of dominical vocation, presides over an enormous body, many of whose celebrations of the Eucharistic liturgy do not reflect the beauty, integrity, and Catholic fullness that it is meant to reflect as part of its place within the Catholic Church. In other words, how can the mosaic of the Catholic Church, Eastern and Western, fulfill its vocation to reflect faithfully the face of Christ to the world when its largest and most prominent member suffers frequently from such public distortions of its own liturgical patrimony? Now again, I'm not here to weigh in on the matter uh, of which Roman Missal should be used, the 1962 or the 1970. I am simply referring to what the current Holy Father, Pope Francis, says while citing the prior Holy Father regarding the celebration of the liturgy in many places. In other words, not just limited to a, a few places. And its periodic abuses and distortions which do not accord with the prescriptions of the new Missal. Pope Francis makes note of the sadness that he suffers at these abuses and distortions, and I believe that we in the Eastern Catholic Churches and Orthodox Churches should also share this fraternal concern of the Holy Father and hope for a restoration and healing on these issues within the Latin Church, which in turn also wounds those churches in solidarity with it when it does not follow its own liturgical tradition. As, this, as the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, 26, quote, if one member suffers, all suffer together, and if one member is honored, all rejoice together. 
Secondly, over many decades, the various Orthodox and Catholic theological dialogues uh, have, have addressed issues pertaining to theological language, and this has been featured very prominently. For instance, the use of the term filioque, or the many Christological issues and debates uh, between the Chalcedonian and Oriental Orthodox focus on the use of particular theological language as a matter of real concern and a source of division between the churches. Uh, these were theological matters, often rooted in cultural, linguistic, and philosophical differences, which provoked uh, hist in, in history uh, divisions. Uh, and in so many respects, they were so difficult, they contributed towards ecclesiastical ruptures and schisms. Although today great progress has been made through engagement in that frank dialogue supported by, supported by Pope St. John Paul II, some issues still remain, and full communion has not been restored. It is my contention that when looking at the matters of liturgical abuses and distortions, which are rarely if ever addressed when they occur by the Latin bishops, we are also dealing here with a significant issue of theological language and the hermeneutics of apostolic faith and tradition. In other words, it's not simply a matter of a lack of conformity with particular liturgical laws that is the concern here but rather how well or how faithfully an apostolic church is communicating its own unique apostolic witness through its liturgical celebration. Here we should be reminded of the teaching of the Catechism of the Catholic Church in an important section on sacramental celebrations, uh, paragraphs 1145 to 1162. Here it has this to say in paragraph 1145, quote, a sacramental celebration is woven from signs and symbols. In keeping with the divine pedag pedagogy of salvation, their meaning is rooted in the work of creation and in human culture, specified by the events of the Old Covenant and fully revealed in the person and work of Christ." End quote. In paragraph 1155 it says, quote, "...the liturgical word and action are inseparable, both insofar as they are signs and instruction and insofar as they accomplish what they signify." When the Holy Spirit awakens faith, he not only gives an understanding of the Word of God, but through the sacraments also makes present the wonders of God which it proclaims. The Spirit makes present and communicates the Father's work fulfilled by the beloved Son." End quote. And then finally in paragraph 1158, quote, "...the harmony of signs, song, music, words, and actions is all the more expressive and fruitful when expressed in the cultural richness of the people of God, of God who celebrate." End quote. Here I would note that the theological concerns then of the Eucharistic liturgy are not simply over creedal matters or texts, but rather, as we see noted in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, in the many signs and symbols of the celebration which form their own liturgical language and that this language of sign and symbol should exist in harmony with the mystery of Christ that is being revealed and celebrated in the liturgy. This view, then, is certainly in accord with the ancient tenet of liturgical theology, lex orandi, lex credendi. The law or rule of prayer is the law or rule of belief. Once we recognize that the rule of prayer or worship is more than simply textual, but encompasses all of the signs and symbols of celebration, such as music, iconography, architecture, vessels, furnishings, vestments, incense, the elements of bread, wine, water, and oil, the rubrics, and so forth, all celebrated in harmony with each other and with the sacred mystery of the Holy Trinity and Jesus Christ. We have to ask, for those, and with regard to those abuses and distortions, what exactly is being asserted theologically and hermeneutically in those particular celebrations? It is far beyond the scope of my presentation, as I mentioned, to consider the myriad of abuses which have taken place both prior to and following the promulgation of the new Roman Missal some 50 years ago. And I say that both because it is an exercise that is hardly edifying, uh, and it is so ubiquitous that it would take me far beyond my allotted time, and also because a simple Google search uh, by anyone with an internet connection can see these manifest issues. That being said, I believe that the underlying theological issues in the Western liturgy, when it is celebrated uh, and abused, are primarily, but not exclusively, Christological. In his article, Eastern Presuppositions and Western Liturgical Reform, the late great liturgist Archimandrite Robert Taft, S.J., while comparing the liturgies of the Byzantine East to that of the Latin West, observes that the Byzantine East has been far more successful in retaining a balance between a high and a low Christology, and that this permeates its liturgical praxis. 
Jesus Christ is both Patrocrator, the Lord Almighty, ascended and reigning over the cosmos at the right hand of the Father, as well as Philanthropos, the lover of mankind, the Lamb of God, and the Good Shepherd. It also focuses on the whole Paschal mystery, the cross, the tomb, the resurrection on the third day, the ascension into heaven, the sitting at the right hand, and the second coming in glory, as is said in the Anaphora of the Byzantine Divine Liturgy. Taft observes, quote, Though there is nothing here to which the Latin Christian would not subscribe, I do not think contemporary Western Christological piety is as successful in holding these realities together in dynamic tension. The West tends towards a Christological schizophrenia, a sort of post-mortem Nestorianism. Its piety ricochets from an excessive familiarity to an excessive Neo-Chalcedonianism from Christology from above to Christology from below. This is just a roundabout way of saying that Western piety tends to be historicizing and its familiarity with the human Jesus leaves the God-man receding back into the divinity." End quote. This lack of balance and tension feeds into extremes, which can be identified in many contemporary uh, Western liturgical celebrations as it relates to the Holy Eucharist. Much of the horizontalization and lack of transcendence which occurs in nearly every diocese, but certainly not every single parish, expresses an almost exclusively low Christological orientation, emphasizing the humanity of Christ at times, even to the detriment of his divinity. For instance, we have the priest, instead of facing the Lord uh, and the East, uh, as uh, what the East believes to be apostolic tradition as taught by St. Basil the Great, uh, instead he faces the people. Uh, the people are gathered around the Lord's table, and the focus is on the here and now. Uh, the manner of celebration seems to volley between a familiar and a theatrical feel. Uh, the church uses contemporary music and instrumentation with melodies and texts composed over the last 20 years. All prayers are recited, simple, and not repeated. Intercessions, when given, vary week to week and are generally composed by the laity and offered by the laity as opposed to the deacon. The iconography is rare, and most of the time, when it exists, uh, in non-traditional parishes, uh, it's not reflective of traditional forms, but could be better ca categorized as a form of naturalistic religious art, that is, Christian, but not necessarily liturgical art. The contemporary architecture is oftentimes soft and round and open and rather egalitarian. The laity move up and around the altar at various moments. Incense is rarely, if ever, used at all. Uh, priests, deacons, and some laity change the words of various liturgical prayers. Uh, the vestments are generally plain, as are the sacred vessels, which are sometimes made of clay pottery or, or glass. And even the laity come forward to distribute Holy Communion to the congregation. These are just a few examples uh, of the impact of this low Christological orientation in the liturgy, uh, this non-transcendent or horizontal approach to the liturgy. And it is also frequently reflected in Bible studies, parish homiletics, and creedal and sacramental catechesis. It is also in this liturgical milieu uh, that the temptation towards abuses and novelty seem to take over with the ascendancy of the personality of the priest taking center stage not heeding the wise counsel of St. John Chrysostom that Christ appears when the priest disappears, such novelties seem to have the opposite effect, that Christ recedes, that he seems to disappear into the background when the priest appears. A recent example of this, although extreme, is noteworthy. A Latin Catholic priest in Illinois, for instance, concluded the Mass by blessing the congregation with a guitar while praying the prayer, quote, loving God, Rock with us as we roll with you. Affirm us so that we may affirm others. Sing your song in us that we may sing it with others." End quote. Now, to be fair, this is just one of the extreme examples, uh, and it is behavior that is not at all common, a common occurrence among uh, Latin Catholic priests, most especially not at all among faithful Latin Catholic priests. But it is illustrative of a problem, and we've seen myriads of, of examples of problems like this, that is affecting the faith of the faithful, most especially since the access to videos of these kinds of liturgies are, are available. Uh, not surprisingly, over 50 years of this prevailing approach in many Western churches uh, has in fact led to a decline for some Latin Catholics personally in the pews, as well as unfortunately in the pulpits, regarding faith in Jesus Christ as fully God, uh, also in Eucharistic faith on the part of Latin Catholics. 
Uh, the USCCB began a three-year initiative towards a Eucharistic revival partly in response to a 2019 poll that indicated that less than one-third of Catholics, Roman Catholics, hold to the Eucharistic doctrine that the bread and the wine become changed into the in the celebration of the Mass into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. Now, why this change in beliefs, then, of so many Latin Catholics, clergy, and faithful? I would contend that unlike the Eastern liturgies, which did not go through such a process of horizontalization, and in fact retained many of the traditional signs and symbols of celebration, uh, that this had the effect of guarding the apostolic tradition, guarding the tradition of apostolic faith in the Holy Trinity in Jesus Christ and the Church, unfortunately, many Latin churches uh, underwent such a process of horizontalization and uh, instead decided to forego the traditional signs and symbols of celebration. When these signs and symbols of celebration are relativized, faith or theological orthodoxy becomes relativized as well. And it's important to note that the Pope since Pius XII until now have all warned Latin Catholic clergy and faithful to follow the wisdom and guidance of the Church and its teachings through the signs and symbols of celebration. It's also important to note that there exists a repository of tradition within the Latin Church that has largely preserved these elements outside of the celebration of the Mass. And here I am referring to the Eucharistic chapels where exposition and adoration of the Blessed Sacrament occurs. Now, as an Eastern Christian, I am not especially fond of the practice of exposition of the Holy Eucharist. Uh, for us, the Eucharist is spiritual food for the mouth. The icons are spiritual food for the eyes. The gospel is spiritual food for the ears. But at the same time, these chapels and services have kept all of the elements of faithful and traditional celebration surrounding the Holy Eucharist, but outside of the Eucharistic liturgy. Here in these chapels, you see, for instance, worship ad orientum, that is, to the east, liturgical chant, uh, even the use of Latin and English, the use of incense, beautiful vestments and vessels, sacred iconography and architecture, and a focus on prayerful adoration. It's well known that both those who, uh, that those who regularly come to these chapels and services have their faith both in Christ and the Eucharist fed and sustained. The question then becomes, if these chapels and associated liturgical practices help Catholics to sustain their faith in the Word made flesh made bread, our Lord Jesus Christ, why not restore all of these practices which originated in the Mass to begin with to the Mass itself? If the Latin West wishes to create a Eucharistic revival, which it needs to, if it desires a more properly evangelical and orthodox faith among its faithful, why not utilize those traditional practices which sustain a full Christological and Eucharistic faith? In other words, why not restore a proper adoration to the Mass? Finally, in building upon these first two points, I believe that the almost wholesale rejection of the traditional signs and symbols of celebration which occurs from time to time in the Latin West means that the West and the East risk no longer having a common theological liturgical language of celebration. These elements preserve, teach, and aid in the participation of the clergy and the faithful in the royal high priesthood of Christ, his Eucharistic mystery, and a balanced Christological synthesis of both high Christology emphasizing the divinity of Christ and low Christology emphasizing his humanity. They are, in fact, uh, a reflection of a common patrimony of Orthodoxy and Catholicism, but East, both Eastern and Western, and it has only been in the past 50 years that the Latin West has undergone a profound shift away from this common language of celebration. The reason for this is well documented. While the Council Fathers of Vatican II sought a more faithful renewal of liturgical worship in the Latin Church, according to the sources of tradition, it also sought a more ecumenical orientation, inclusive of both Orthodoxy in the East and Protestantism in the West. Following the Council, however, the implementation of the reforms and renewal efforts took a decidedly and almost exclusive Protestant emphasis in their approach. And in many respects, we see the trajectory of this approach playing out today. What is needed, therefore, is a proper reorientation of the Occidental West, not to adopt Eastern practices per se, 
but to restore those liturgical practices, both common universal signs, those common universal signs of celebration, which are held in common with East and West, both Catholic and Orthodox, to the, the celebration of the Eucharist. In fact, the Latin West has within its own repository of sacred tradition the means of expressing the beauty and glory of its own patrimony. Some of these common universal practices include restoration of the public celebration of the divine office in parishes, the use of sacred liturgical iconography, the use of in incense in every celebration of the Eucharist, the restoration of sacred chant in the Western tradition, especially Gregorian chant and polyphony, the restoration of the sung Eucharistic liturgy, especially the sung canon, <clears throat> the use of the proper liturgical text, so in the Roman Missal, inclusive of antiphons for the entrance, intercessions, offertory, and communion, for instance, beautiful sacred vestments and vessels, holy communion provided through intinction, and ad orientum worship. Uh, the, if we think about every Christian church as a liturgical uh, mountain, it's about ascending the liturgical mountain of God together. So we're all journeying together as we ascend to encounter the Lord and to receive uh, his sacred body and blood and his Holy Spirit uh, through the sacred mysteries. And so all of us facing together in that worship, facing the Lord together, is the traditional form of Christian worship. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, it's mentioned by uh, St. Basil the Great in his, um, his work on the Holy Spirit as a teaching of the apostles, an unwritten teaching of the apostles. I think also St. John of Damascus mentions it, mentions it as well. So to reject or even ardently oppose these universal practices, and uh, let's just say that at times uh, certain bishops have been rather punitive with priests who have attempted to restore them. It is in fact to take a sectarian posture which distances the Latin Catholic Church away from our Orthodox brothers and sisters and even away from those Eastern churches in communion with the Catholic Church. And so it is finally for these three reasons that I am appealing first to our Orthodox brothers and sisters and those involved in the official dialogues to make this matter of a common language of celebration a priority in the discussions between Catholics and Orthodox. And secondly, I appeal to our spiritual fathers in the Latin Catholic bishops to fulfill their commission reiterated by Pope Francis to be guardians of the tradition of apostolic witness expressed through worship and work with your, working with your assisting priests to not only remove all the abuses and distortions, but to teach and restore the universal principles of Orthodox Catholic worship to all of your parishes. And so in conclusion, we ask for the grace of the Most Holy Spirit to guide us in wisdom, in truth, and in charity as we entrust ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ and through him to our Holy Heavenly Father. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory to Jesus Christ, glory forever.